All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm so happy that you're here tonight to join us for this conversation on crisis lawyering, effective legal advocacy in emergency situations. My name is Iris Modi Gibson. I'm on the board of GW Laws American Constitution Society chapter. We're particularly excited about hosting this event um, at the close of an academic year and a year that's brought experiences of isolation, trauma, and injustice for so many of our communities. And tonight we're happy to be looking to several leaders who have gotten in proximity to crisis and in distinct ways lent their skills towards more just outcomes and towards, towards deeper connections. Uh, to begin this conversation, I'd like to acknowledge the inst our institutions stand on ceded and unceded traditional homelands of tribes, bands, First Nations who stewarded this land and have excuse me, who steward this land and have done so since time immemorial. Uh, since folks are joining us tonight from many places, I encourage you to learn about the people whose land you stand on um, and however, excuse me, the land you stand on, I encourage you to do so by looking um, to nativeland.ca. As students of law and practitioners, we have a responsibility to examine our relationship to the land that we live and learn on and to foster um, relationships with indigenous communities whose traditions and identities originated here. The histories of this place and present day policies reflect detrimental effects of displacement, violence, and erasure of indigenous people. We offer this acknowledgement not in place of genuine uh, relationships with indigenous communities, but as a step towards learning and action. For those of you who are here joining from GW today, I encourage you after this event at eight o'clock to join us for our general, um, general board meeting in which we'll be electing uh, board of directors for the coming year. We're also grateful to be hosting this, this event um, with our ACS partners. I'll turn it over now um, to Ben from American. Hi everyone, thanks Iris. Um, my name is Ben James. I am the president of the ACS student chapter at the American University Washington College of Law here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're super excited to be co-sponsoring today's event along with the GW and Albany chapters of the American Constitution Society. And we just wanted to um, echo what Iris, Iris was saying and extend our thanks to the speakers for being here today. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, for anyone who is joining us from the Washington College of Law, please feel free to follow our chapter on Facebook and Twitter, and also email acs at wcl.american.edu if you're interested in being added to our listserv, which is where we discuss upcoming events, pro bono opportunities, and all sorts of great ACS-related things like that. Uh, so next up, I believe it's Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Harris Brzezowski, and I am the co-chair of the Albany Law School's chapter of the American Constitution Society. My co-chair, Alicia Landis, wanted to be here today, but unfortunately, she had a uh, um, she couldn't be here. She has a prior event. We're very excited to have you all here, and we hope that you enjoy and learn a lot from our event. Uh, I will now turn it over to Professor Rogerson in order to begin our panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I am not Ray Brescia, who everyone was expecting tonight. I'm, I am Professor Rogerson. I'm a professor of law. I direct the Justice Center at Albany Law School. Uh, Ray cannot be here this evening because of a last minute family emergency, um, but he regrets very much that he is unable to join us and I will do my very best in his stead. Thank you to our sponsors this evening, especially to the students, the American Constitution Society, student chapters at George Washington School of Law, American University, Washington College of Law, and Albany Law School. Thank you also to our additional sponsors, the Washington DC Lawyers Chapter of the American Constitution Society and the National American Constitution Society. Thanks also to the staff at Albany Law School for their assistance in hosting this event most notably Lisa Ravaj and Jeff Sieber. Just a little more housekeeping. If you're interested in receiving CLE for this event, you have to stay on for the entire session and you have to submit the affidavit that was shared with you via with the Zoom invite um, and send that to Lisa Rivage at Albany Law School. 
you can email her at lriva at Albany Law School, or, or at, sorry, at albanylaw.edu uh, once you have completed it. I will release two codes throughout the session. You will need to take note of those and put them in the affidavit where appropriate. You must fill out the form in its entirety to receive the CLE credit. Albany Law is accredited to issue CLE for New York State only, but most states CLE boards will recognize our CLE. We can't make that guarantee, um, but submit the affidavit and um, Lisa and our team will do their best to get it turned around to you. In a moment, I'll introduce the other speakers who are also contributors to the Crisis Lawyering book, which I happen to have a copy of right here. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about this cherished volume. Crisis Lawyering is a compilation of first person accounts of lawyers, as well as law students who uh, took on crisis situations on behalf of their clients. It tells of their experiences, their victories, their defeats, and tries to extrapolate some lessons learned from those experiences so that you all, uh, whether you're practicing now or intend to practice in the very near future, can learn from those experiences, learn from our mistakes. There are chapters on the first 24 hours after the issuance of the first Trump Muslim ban, and the securing of a nationwide injunction against it, to chapters on representing detainees on Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, dealing with the effects and trying to prevent climate change, trying to get ICE out of the New York state courts, and representing a survivor of intimate partner violence before the US Supreme Court and ultimately the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The book tries to draw this distinction between a typical client crisis and the type of crisis that poses new challenges to lawyers, what the book refers to as a lawyer crisis. Not every client crisis is a crisis for the lawyer. Uh, an eviction, a criminal charge, a threat of deportation, these are the types of crises that a lawyer prepares for um, that, that they probably handle all the time, um, but to the client is very much a crisis to them. The lawyer knows just what to do and when to do it, typically. That client crisis is not generally seen as a crisis for that lawyer. On the other hand, a lawyer crisis, the type of crisis discussed in the chapters throughout this book, presents new challenges for lawyers. Factual situation is uncertain. The law, unclear. And they must often respond in an extremely accelerated time frame. These are the types of lawyers' crises you can read about in the book and the type we'll hear more about today. Indeed, today, we've got three of the contributors, including myself. Uh, the, our full bios are up in the materials that you received when you signed up, and I, we won't go through reading those today. But quickly, the first person we'll hear from is Christy Lopez, a professor from practice at Georgetown Law School uh, and one of the primary authors of the Department of Justice's Ferguson Report. She will talk about her chapter, which deals with her experiences doing that work. Next is Richard Pinner, who is the Associate General Counsel at the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. He will talk about his experiences first as a law student working to address the emerging homelessness crisis in New York City in the 1980s. Finally, as I said, I teach at Albany Law and I'll share my thoughts on my experience representing immigrants in detention locally in a place that they weren't supposed to be. Uh, we plan to have a dialogue here amongst the panelists and then we'll have a Q&A toward the end, co-moderated by our student hosts. So please put your questions in the chat box and we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. All right, so let's begin. Um, we'll kick it off with a conversation about the types of crises that y'all have faced in your respective practice areas and an assessment of the similarities and differences between them. So Christy, your chapter talks about your role in writing the Ferguson Report and you set up this tension between an acute crisis and a chronic crisis, which I think is a really important uh, way to kick this off. And I'm sure you've been watching the Derek Chauvin trial. Tell us how this acute slash chronic crisis framework played out for you in the work that you did in Ferguson. Thank you so much um, for having me here today and thank you everyone for attending. Um, 
Yeah, I, um, it was interesting to hear you talk, Sarah, about the, um, how the client's crisis isn't your crisis, um, because when I was at the DOJ, when the client is your boss, um, the United States, um, the client's crisis is your crisis, um, and it can be quite challenging. And the way that I came to think, um, and the way I try to describe it in the chapter of the book that I drafted is that in, when it comes to policing crises, um, it's useful to think of them as crises. One is the acute crises. It's the terrible, um, usually shooting um, death caused by an officer um, that has set a city alight um, and things are very tense. The factual situation is uncertain, as you noted, um, there is intense scrutiny. Um, there is uh, great pressure to get things done um, and get them done right. And what right is, is often in dispute. Um, that acute crisis, however, takes place against a backdrop of a much more chronic crisis um, of policing in America. And the more I came to understand the complexity of that crisis and how much of that crisis is caused by things that are entirely outside the purview of the Department of Justice and its pattern or practice uh, authority, um, the more I tried to adjust the way I approach these cases. In the work I was doing with the Civil Rights Division, our job was to go in, um, and we did often, not always, but often go in after there, had, there was a, an acute crisis in places like Ferguson, Baltimore, Chicago, um, and we would try to do our work um, in the midst of that acute crisis. But our work was really to address the chronic crisis, at least in part. Our work was to try to um, address not, not that crisis, not that particular act or its outcomes or its effect, um, but to address its underlying root causes. We were authorized under the statute we were enforcing to determine whether there was a pattern or practice of misconduct and then to seek to um, uh, bring a civil suit, negotiate a consent decree, whatever it took to try to correct that. Um, it became very clear to me that um, we, the, what the authority we were given, which was to ensure that police officers are policing in accordance with the law, would only go so far to correcting the policing crisis. Um, and so, uh, what I learned from that was to do my part, um, try to do the best that I could to um, put structures in place that would ensure that police were um, policing in accord with the law. And I think there's real importance in that, both because you vindicate people's rights and because you are able to prevent harm in the future. But I also tried to uh, you know, instill on, on, among my teammates and to create a culture in which we're also creating space for the others. Um, who would continue to do this work after we left. Um, and by others, I mean community groups, I mean activists, I mean judges, I mean whomever was going to be around to continue to do this work um, that would often be much more expansive than just the work of ensuring that policing was happening, happening lawfully. And I'm happy to talk more um, a little later about how we would go about doing that and what lessons I found um, helpful uh, in making sure that we were doing our work in a way that was supporting that broader work. Excellent. And I think this, this, this um, acute versus chronic frame also is set up nicely in using different language. And at the beginning of Richard, your chapter, um, you were just, just a law student. <laughs> um, I should say there's no such thing. It's just a law student. But you were a law student when you started working to address the homeless crisis in New York City in the 1980s. So tell us what that was like. Um, and were you working from a fairly blank slate or were there well-worn paths that you could follow? Um, and I guess I'd add to that, are there paths that, that you've blazed that might be helpful for us to follow now in the current iteration of this crisis? So, Well, and um, I mean, pathways in terms of the, um, uh, you know, in terms of kind of like the substantive um, element of it, it was relatively new. So I, I was definitely in law school. Um, the kind of the beginnings of the homeless rights movement or, and particularly from a litigation point of view began in the mid to late seventies. Um, and the case in New York was called Callahan and that was the right to shelter. Um, by the time I, you know, came about, you know, 1987, you could say, well, that was already established. Um, in New York, it's by consent decree and there's only a handful of uh, jurisdictions in the United States that recognize the right to shelter. Obviously, New York with 8 million people is by far the largest. 
Um, so there was some jurisprudence on these topics, but a lot of it, you know, and here the you know conservatives would would uh, uh, definitely chime in. A lot of it we made up as we went along. I mean, these were all cases of first impression, um, and we really relied on activist judges, you know, kind of reading between the lines to carve out uh, these new areas of law, new new substantive rights. Um, you know, I will say that one of the things that I think is you know important this the difference between a kind of acute and chronic. It's an acute problem to the person who's sleeping on the street. The problem is the answer isn't acute. You can't immediately kind of snap your fingers and say, this is the solution. This is how we solve the problem. You know, putting aside, even if you could get a court to order it immediately, people can't build this stuff. You can't change these systems overnight. And that was, you know, kind of the toggling back and forth of, you know, identifying these hugely traumatic, um, you know, crises for people um, in doing your best to move fast, but fast can take years. And, I, you know, I think it's interesting uh, for those of you who read my bio, I now work at an organization that funds, in, uh, you know, among other things, low income housing. That stuff takes years to build. And it's still, you know, this is still an ongoing thing. So there's that whole tension between Here's a tremendous problem. Somebody is sleeping on the streets and how do you solve the problem for them? How do you prevent it for people going forward? Um, and, you know, and how do you build you know, a robust housing system um, that makes this no longer a problem? And those are all very, very different timeframes. Um, I will say one, one thing that occurred to me, you know, you know, every time you talk about something, you think, hey, I should have put that in the chapter. Um, but there are people who used to come into the office um, when I worked at the Coalition of the Homeless, and you would try to find them shelter. You would try to find them temporary housing. You would try to help them, you know, however you could. And that was, you know, you, could, you can't just say, we don't do that. Uh, we only do impact litigation. It's very hard, you know, kind of from a moral point of view to say, um, I'm representing you, but not really. And that was how we handled that, you know, particular element of it. And, and that also, to be honest, and it's kind of getting ahead of myself, that's what made it worthwhile. I think it's very easy to kind of lose track of being in the middle and not touching things and not seeing things. Um, but you're really, you know, it really does give you focus when you've got somebody who's sitting in a chair across from you saying, I have nowhere else to go. Definitely. Um, that actually kind of, I'll add in my two bits as we go along. Um, but Try not to. I will try not to hog the mic too much. Since I also am getting a lot of airtime in the in the surprise moderation. But I did want to sort of respond to that because um, one of the things that happened, and this sort of blends into the next question in in our particular crisis. Ours was um, I would call it a situational crisis, because what had happened was um, the students. All students have the best ideas. Y'all have. All, all of the best moments of my career as a law professor have started with a student idea. And a student alerted me to the fact that um, our local county jail was detaining um, immigrants under a, a, a contract with the Federal Marshal Service, actually, that ICE Immigration Customs Enforcement sort of rode along on. And we started, I guess, eight years ago now, <laughs> based on a student tip to start uh, interviewing these individuals who found themselves in, in a county jail who were actually under the custody of the federal government. Um, and to see if there was anything that could be done either with regard to um, typically the minor violation that landed them there, or if they were temporarily there as a transfer from the federal system. Um, and, and what happened was after you spend that much time in a jail, which is not a, wasn't at the time a typical place um, for large volumes of immigrant detainees to be held, um, you start to learn a little bit about, about the culture of, of jails and sort of what goes on inside of them. And one of the interesting things that happened after we were able to respond to the crisis where essentially as a result of this relationship, the local sheriff um, had, knew that he had the infrastructure in place to take what was happening at the, at the border in the summer of 2018 where um, the Trump administration was enforcing their family separation policy, which at the time they, they um, said did not exist, but in fact, now we know it did. Um, and basically before these folks had a chance to be interviewed, um, which is the typical process when you present yourself for asylum, they were all put on a plane at a hundred per plane and flown to various 
local jails all over the country, Albany County being one of them. And the theory was they're better off in, in our jail than in the detention the facilities at the border where people were really languishing and um, lots of terrible things are happening that are being litigated in the courts now. But the students quickly, when they were, when we responded, that was a, a crisis of numbers because typically we had only handled about 35 to 40 at a time, um, detainees being transferred from the local federal detention facility in a very different legal situation. And now we were sort of pivoting to responding to 350 folks over eight days from like 27 different countries and speaking 19 different languages um, and mobilizing lawyers from all over the country to respond to that. We ended up getting to know the, the processes at the jail and one of the issues was homelessness. Um, so we started encountering all these other issues that people who were re-entering were not finding stable shelter and then ending up committing some sort of, you know, engaging in some sort of crime in order to um, survive and then landing back in the jail again. And so one of the interesting lessons uh, from this particular experience was that we, we brought in the scope of our work with the, with the sheriff and he had this idea to take, um, to take a part of the, of the local county jail that had not been used because they had such many progressive programs to reduce recidivism, tear out the bars, turn them in for scrap, use the money from the scrap to turn them into a homeless facility that also had wraparound services for um, addiction recovery, counseling. Um, it was just sort of like one of those um, transformative moments where you're engaged in one crisis and are able to be a part, a small part, we weren't the main part, but a small part of informing the response to another crisis. And it's sort of like the code switch between acute and chronic <laughs> um, and how being a lawyer can sort of thrust you into crisis all the time, some planned and some unplanned. Um, I wanna just pause here for a moment to read the first CLE code and I'll hold it up as well. It's crisis and the number one, crisis one. We can't put these in the chat for obvious reasons. So write it down now. And we'll move on to the next question, which is, as I alluded to, lessons in the midst of crisis. So the nation at, the, at any given moment um, faces several crises, but this is a particularly, I guess, to borrow the term acute moment of several um, concentric circles of crises. We have the pandemic, a racial justice crisis, and the crisis of democracy and the rule of law. So how have your experiences in handling your dis discrete crises, if there is such a thing, um, inform how the legal profession addresses these current, I don't wanna say larger because part of what you've addressed is part and parcel of these crises, right? Help us understand where do we go? What do we do? Maybe Christy, that's for you. You can kick us off. Okay. Um, so I had a difficult time disaggregating my role as a lawyer um, in this crisis work from my role as a government lawyer. I do think it's a little bit odd or different. Um, and I'm not, I could be wrong about that, but I, I, I'm only saying that to say that I'm not, I'm not sure how uh, universal my lessons are. Um, I think to some, in some respects they are, but in some respects they may not be. You know, one of the things I, I, I thought was really important is the value added that a career employee can provide in these crises. And we've, there's been a lot of talk over the deep state. Um, and there's, there was definitely, you know, one of the things I realized after going through many, leading many of the investigations in different cities um, in these practice cases, <clears throat> uh, there was a lot of turnover at the political level and so what was, that, what was my third, fourth, fifth, eighth, 10th case or whatever, it was often the first case, the first crisis that the political level was dealing with. And they were, you know, they were not used to it. They were not used to the pressure from all sides. They were not used to the intense scrutiny. They didn't know that, they often did not know the issues um, that we were dealing with as well. And so I realized that part of my job was to manage their crisis. Um, and um, 
And that meant a few things. One was to ensure that in addressing the immediate crisis, I was attentive, attentive to and tried to get them to be attentive to this deeper crisis and try to ensure that our immediate response didn't undermine um, the broader, deeper work. And that could be anything from a particular position we were taking, uh, making sure that, it, you know, thinking about how that might impact other cases. Um, the work that I knew was being done by community groups and community members and making sure that we were not um, undermining that. And, and, and I think really importantly, um, given where I was doing this work from, um, making sure they remembered that we were in DOJ, but we were in the civil rights division of DOJ. And uh, that was not without its compromises, but I definitely tried to push that as much as I could. Um, you know, a lot of the people we were reporting to, most of the people we were, we were reporting to were not in the Civil Rights Division, had other concerns. They were representing people in ICE. They were representing uh, DEA and FBI components with guns. Um, and they had a very different set of interests that we did in the Civil Rights Division. And I really tried to get people um, to be clear that we were on the side of the Constitution, we were on the side of civil rights, and that gave us an obligation that did not always comport with the interests of other um, parts of the department, and we were going to have to do our best to align that given it was all one client, the United States. Um, so I think that's a one really important role that a, an attorney can play in that crisis um, moment is with experience coming through and trying to um, not lose the forest for the trees and um, ensure that whatever you do in that moment to address the, the immediate pressure that you're dealing with doesn't inadvertently undermine um, the much broader, deeper work that you know is going to go on for decades. That is such um, a tricky landscape to navigate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and Richard, I'm sure it's, um, different but also similar sort of in, in the position that you were in i mean what what how does your experience sort of inform um the the trifecta crisis that we are that we're in now that that really was foreshadowed in in the work that that all of us have been doing well i mean i think the tools are the same ones i mean you know there's the ability to go into court um there's media there's reports there's grassroots lobbying. Those things exist basically, you know, in every situation. How you prioritize them is kind of what the trick is, depending on what the situation is. You know, if somebody, you know, is is you know uh, being deported. The first thing you think of, you, you don't think of, is like, hey, let's do a grassroots campaign. Your first thing you think of is going to court and get a restraining order. So it really does depend on what the situation is, but the elements are the same. And I think that was a really important lesson to learn. And I think the other thing I learned from it is most lawyers don't do that. Most lawyers basically say, I'm a litigator. This I go into court, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't talk to the press um, or I don't know anything about camp, you know, grassroots campaigning. I don't know anything about lobbying. I don't know anything about how to do, you know, a newsletter. Um, you know, there are all these elements that really are not just litigatory, they're, um, you know, non-litigatory and persuasive. And I think people just need to kind of keep an eye on all these uh, tools that you have to be able to deal with them. But you have to look at every situation differently and try to, you know, reorder them or rejigger them depending on what, you know, is confronting you. You can't, if something, you know, that's an absolute emergency, you can't sit around, you know, hypothesizing how to deal with it. You need to move quick. Um, and you're always better off moving fast and then trying to refigure it out later. I think, uh, you know, you know, it's kind of like the corollary. I think a lot of people also sometimes will sit on their hands trying to figure out the perfect answer to something versus you got to get a move on. Um, and I think I learned that a lot, um, you know, from dealing with homeless folks who, again, you know, they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. They didn't know where they were sleeping that night. And they didn't want you to sitting there talking about, um, you know, theories of housing. Um, they wanted you to do something then and there. We can talk about the other stuff later. And, and, and the, the crisis that we're in now, it's the same. It's all the same elements. Um, even though uh, the subject matter is different. Great. Yeah, I just, I taught a systemic advocacy class today um, to, to my clinic students, and we talked about all these overlapping circles, right? There's the lawyer as lobbyist, the lawyer as communications director, the lawyer as grassroots organizer. Um, and in these types, it, it's very 
hard to determine, especially when you care so much about the subject matter, which all of us do, to remember to um, cabin your skills around these different roles, right? How did you, this isn't, this wasn't a planned question, but I'm deeply curious. <laughs> How did you navigate, you know, deciding when, when this was um, an issue where you could identify as a movement lawyer, if you ever have identified as such versus, you know, I guess in the DOJ your role is, is fairly well defined, but I, I think what you're talking about um, in terms of the Civil Rights Bureau, right? What, what sort of um, flexibility was there for you to make certain choices around, around how to approach the crisis from the multiple hats that we wear as lawyers in the world? For me? Sure. <laughs> Well, you mentioned DOJ, so I, I yeah. So I, um, I think it is. It, um, I didn't find it particularly easy, but I also don't think that I found it as difficult as some might think. Um, and maybe I'm just fully myself, but I am. Um, I think it helps that I never had sort of. I was never particularly ambitious, um, and I never. And I'm not really averse to conflict um, or have a strong need to have tons of friends. And so I was able to just sort of do what I and this sounds really terrible self-aggrandizing, I don't mean it this way, but um, I just sort of tried to do what I thought was right uh, and um, and try, and that was not easy or um, it was always, wasn't was always right that you, you weren't always clear you're making the right decision, but I tried to just um, recognize that we had a limited role to play, that I couldn't change all policing or fix everything for everybody through this and I was gonna do my job, but I was just going to try to understand um, the other work that was being done in, and try to not conflict with that where I didn't have to. And that basically, I mean, I was, I annoyed everybody all the time, um, both internally and externally. Um, movement attorneys would be very unhappy with me. Well, why are you doing this? Um, you know, and and my, my, you know, bosses and some of my colleagues at, at DOJ would be like, well, why are you doing that? And, um, you know, I think over time, um, I gained the confidence to be, um, to know, to feel like I would, to believe that I was, you know, that I was doing the right thing. And, and I always tried to sort of keep, you know, keep some principles in mind for why I was doing things a certain way that try to keep me, I think, kind of on an even keel. Um, but I just really, I had to reject the idea. You know, I had to be like, I'm not a movement lawyer. I'm not, you know, a, a, a DOJ political. I am a civil rights attorney trying to address the issue of systemic um, policing, police misconduct um, and problematic policing in this country. Um, and so I just really, uh, I think that's, I think it really does actually just help if you can be committed to the principle of the thing. Um, and, you know, I, my, my, one of my good friends, uh, Lisa Dugard, uh, said to me once that, um, you know, I, I, uh, she, that I follow a mantra that she follows and I didn't, I think she's right, although I didn't realize until she said it, which is you um, don't fall in love with your solution, you fall in love with, with um, solving the problem. And I think if you can kind of take that approach, like this is a problem we need to solve. I've got one part of the solution and I may change my mind or that's gonna change, but there's a lot of people who are working on this and we need to be really open and support everybody with their different solutions trying to solve this problem. Um, and I think that's the closest I can get to sort of a unifying principle to whatever it was I was trying to do. I love that. that <laughs> so yeah, um, that's, yeah that's, that's wonderful advice. And I see so many of my students on here. So I'm, I'm <laughs> you guys are very lucky. Um, so, and it, it sort of reminded me of, of, of lessons that, that I learned in my experience too, because literally the day before, um, I got the call that, uh, you know, exploring this idea of, of providing access to counsel to people that would otherwise, um, be stuck, uh, in, in humane conditions at the border. Um, we were, I, I was working with grassroots movements to set up a meeting with the sheriff to ask him to shut down his, um, the operations at the facilities with regard to undocumented immigrants. Um, we were about to uh, work with several grassroots movements to see if he would be open to publicly declaring that he would no longer house immigrants in his facility. Uh, but then when this happened, I, I had to do a quick about face within 24 hours to the same grassroots folks and say, look, here from a legal perspective, here's the trade off right now. And maybe possibly in the long run, we can get to where we want to be if we handle this moment and this crisis the right way. 
Um, I didn't know what the right way would be, but I made it clear that they would have input <laughs> um, and that we may not always agree. So Christy, I think it's also what you're saying is it's important to be honest about where you are at any moment and, and to be honest when you can about the fact that you may be switching roles for the duration of a, of a set period of time and then revisit the issue. Wouldn't you know it, there are no more immigrants being detained at the Albany County Jail absent a warrant, which is never really issued. So, so it's, it's like one of those situations. And we were able also to, to get local police to uh, the county police to agree um, to make a statement that ICE was not welcome in the, in the court, in the local courthouses before it was a law. So, you know, being honest can lead to, to an expansion of opportunities for you to advocate, even if you're limiting your role in a certain scenario in order to get the job done. Um, but I know Richard probably has more to add to this from his perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think there are two things that, you know, kind of just occurred to me. One is um, we oftentimes, uh, some of the better advocates that we had on our side were agency attorneys who were working within the governmental uh, organizations that we were suing. I mean, part of it was they were politically sympathetic. I mean, they weren't going to undermine their client, but they could certainly operate within their agencies to make um, a case to their bosses about how to settle, how to look at something, how to come out looking better than getting clobbered in court. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it was it was a fairly complicated, um, you know, kind of tap dance because you can't ask somebody to, you know, not, uh, you know, advocate for their client, but there were folks that were more sympathetic than others. And I think that that was, you know, very helpful. And we knew who they were um, and we could, you know, appeal to their, you know, uh, better senses as humans and try to, you know, um, exploit the wrong word, try to use that to our advantage. And again, they also recognize that losing, uh, you know, losing cases consistently and then fighting everything didn't make as much sense as, you know, trying to come up with something that was acceptable to everybody, um, you know, and, it could, and that could be implemented. Um, you know, and the, the, similar to that, oftentimes, you know, people that were not necessarily our natural uh, allies if you explained it to them, you would get them on your side. So for example, a lot of the uh, litigation I worked on were people being dumped out of psychiatric hospitals without a place to go or not being admitted you know, if they needed care and treatment because there wasn't enough space. And you would think that the oppositional side would be like the psychiatrists, the hospitals, et cetera. But the way we pitched it to them is you can't do your job. You know, We're trying to get you resources so that you can treat your patients adequately and correctly and not being asked to commit malpractice on a daily basis by triaging the worst of the worst um, and not giving people what they, you know, the, the, the services that they really needed. Um, and so, you, you know, a lot of times you just say, who's out there and how do we figure out um, to kind of get them on our side of the equation, whether that was in-house agency counsel or doctors working for this, you know, for the Health and Hospitals Corporation of the city of New York. And it was, a, it was a very effective tool that way. Um, and again, it's also, you're better off trying to come up with something that's acceptable to folks and a compromise versus if somebody wants to drag out litigation, you know, basically any idiot can, you know, can just keep on filing motions and you die by paper. And that doesn't, that doesn't benefit anybody. So the trick was not to make it as adversarial as it could have been. Right. Yeah, so that that resonates as well. Um, I think a lot of this has to do with team building, which both of you are speaking to as well. And with with other lawyers, with potentially um, even lawyers who may be traditionally opposed to you. And then with, I, I hate that we have this term non-lawyers. It's like there's lawyers and then there's everybody else, that, which really centers us in a really weird way. Um, but, you know, people who don't identify as lawyers, <laughs> but who have skills and talents to bring to the problem, right? Like Christy said, um, fall in love with solving the problem. And, and some of the best problem solvers um, that we had on our team included, um, you know, semi-retired engineers who were just really good with data um, because we had a, a bottleneck of data. You can imagine 300, you know, increasing a, a jail population by 350 people in eight days creates um, a bottleneck of data um, for, for us to manage from a project management standpoint. Um, and so engineers saved the day. <laughs> um, 
And you never know, um, untraditional, untraditional allies. We also ended up getting um, a lot more information from our local um, sheriff's office than we could ever negotiate or, or obtain from the Department of Homeland Security, um, just in, in terms of responding. Yeah, I, I would add say I mean, to what you just said. You know, triggered something in my mind, which is there's a tendency among litigators, lawyers, and litigators in particular, to think, "Hey, I can master this in ten hours." You know, give me the New York Times, and I'll read a couple of stories, and I got this. And that's not true. Um, you know, I think to you know, like one of the more important parts to me is knowing what you don't know. And a lot of times, you find out the answers by relying on people who are not litigators. Uh, you know, the skill that a lawyer can bring oftentimes is, you know, kind of synthesizing the information, being able to present it in a, in a way that's understandable to other folks. Um, I have one colleague who said, the only thing I learned in law school is how to analogize and how to distinguish. I mean, that was it. And there's a, it's a little simplified, um, but it's not totally untrue. And then you'd sometimes need statisticians, historians, engineers to kind of help round out what you have, you know, in your arsenal of information. And again, I think I used to I used to fight with the lawyers at the large law firms who um, uh, were co-counsel, and they would never give in. And this is not knocking large law firms, but there's this tendency to think I can figure this out on just a handful of hours. Um, and I used to say, "You do this for you've done this for 24 hours. I've done this for two and a half years." Um, and that was me being an obnoxious you know, 24 year old, but um, there are some, there are some elements of that where it's hard to, it's hard to go through law school and work in law firms and not have the kind of confidence of, I know I've never done products liability cases in the Northern District of Ohio, but I got to learn it by tomorrow. And so I'm going to, you know, say that I got it. There's just, that's just an element. I think that's um, a little too pervasive and it was harmful in these cases where people thought they understood it um, when it was a little more complicated than that. Can I actually, yeah, go, go for it. Well, point and it raises so many things and let's see if I can organize these, but I definitely knew more when I was 25 than I do now about the things that I do every day. Um, in my own mind, I felt like I knew 90% of what there was to know. And now I'm like, oh, I know maybe 20% of what there is to know. And I think in particular going from city to city, we would go into these whole new communities and I'd be like, oh, I've done a police case. I know what this is like. And you very quickly learn that you have no idea what it's like. And the biggest thing you can do wrong is to assume that the problem here is like the problem last place and the community here is like the community. Really important. But I wanted to surface, you know, the point about, you know, uh, Richard's point about it's hard, you know, not, not to start that with if you don't have the confidence. And I think that can be particularly difficult for um, attorneys of color and for women because so much of what you have to do is like show this, that you know what you're doing against people who are, pretty intent, or their assumption is just, is you're, you're not gonna get the same benefit of the doubt as a attorney. And so you have to simultaneously show, I know what I'm talking about, I'm confident, I can do this. Well, having a lot of humility about what you don't know and asking the questions without being seen as you're asking questions because you don't know anything. And that's a really, that can be a very tricky thing to navigate, especially at the beginning when you really don't have the confidence that you're trying to convey, right? So I just, I don't wanna, I, I just want to make it's a really important skill to develop, but I don't want to underestimate how difficult it is to for anyone to develop and especially for some cohorts to develop. But once you do, it can be so powerful um, and also still tricky. People expect lawyers to be jerks, basically, right? Especially if you're a litigator. And they're kind of surprised when you're kind of not a jerk. I mean, I'm sure there are many people I'm sure who think I'm a jerk, but I think generally, you know, you, you, know, you can you could you don't have to be a bulldog to be a, a really good litigator. But the Sometimes then people think, well, you're not really going to litigate. And then we had that happen time and time again. And, and Ferguson was one perfect example. We worked really hard with, you know, to teach the individuals against whom we were, with whom we were negotiating the consent decree, why we were trying to change policing, why we were doing what we were doing. We really tried not to be, you know, there was a big power differential between the Department of Justice in that time and this tiny town of Ferguson. And we were like, we're, we tried to sort of clear that out of the room and just like, here's what we think is the best agreement. And they responded to that by, well, we're not going to sign this consent decree that we just spent, you know, six months in, uh, negotiating. We're like, you're Ferguson. It's the Department of Justice. We have all the facts. Why would you do this? And I'm, I'm pretty convinced it was in part because they were like, oh, they're nice people. I'm like, you know, this is not, I, you know, we we built our case, and and so that was that's part of it as well. You have to always be, you have to not be. 
um, unnecessarily obstreperous, but always be building your case so that you are ready at the drop of the hat. You've got your facts, you've got everything, and you can file suit. You can't let, you have to be pursuing on those, two, you have to be um, proceeding on those two tracks at the same time. Um, and that's particularly difficult during a crisis because you really don't have time to even do one of those things, but you cannot let one of them drop. You have to do both things. And I truly hope that this is prompting, it's prompting a lot of questions in my mind, um, and you have a, a pretty unique opportunity here to, to, to um, pick my co-panelist's brain, so to speak. So definitely add your questions to the chat um, as they come up, because we'll be able to organize them um, and address them towards the end. Uh, but this, this leads me to, to our next structured question, um, which is what recommendations do you have for lawyers or law students and this, this question is particularly tricky, I think, um, but who want to crisis proof their current or future practice to the extent that they're able. And maybe maybe someone wants to tackle the premise of that question. <laughs> but um, Richard, do you want to take this one first? Uh, only because you just drafted me. Um, I, 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 will, I will give Ray credit for saying to the extent they are able. Um, I think this is really hard to I mean, you know, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but it was Rumsfeld. What is it? There's knowns, unknowns, and unknown, un unknown, unknowns. There are, you can only guess what's coming next. And you can do that with some degree of 50 50. Um, I think if you'd gone back 15 months ago and said, what would happen if there's this sickness that goes around and everybody's working from home and you know 500,000 people are dead and by the way everybody stops paying rent right or a lot of people stop paying rent you know i work in housing we are the largest syndicator of uh tax credits that uh build low income housing in the united states the way the buildings continue to operate are people pay rent. If people stop paying rent, you can't pay for electricity and heat, even for buildings that are, you know, locked in as low income. That's, I mean, that is a major crisis that, you know, that we could never have anticipated. You know, when you, you know, not to get into the details, but if you run numbers, you do like a 7% loss on revenue. Nobody does a 40% loss on revenue. That's been unheard of in American society. I mean, nobody goes back to say, okay, the flu epidemic of 1919. Um, so there's just some stuff you could not, you know, um, uh, you could not really anticipate. At the end of the day, you look and say, hey, these are the tools we've got, right? It's a fixed set of things. It's almost like, you know, uh, property, uh, you know, property rights. Nobody can invent new things. We can extend the loan out. We can try to, you know, um, cut the interest rates. We can lend you more money if we have the capital. So there's this, you know, we have these tools um, that exist and you just try to use them as best as possible. But it really was, you know, it was, there was no way anybody could have anticipated this particular thing or, you know, go back more than a decade, Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, that wiped out more units of housing than the organization I work for had done in the previous 40 years. So you, you start to look at some of these numbers, you start to look at how these things play themselves out. And you know, crises um, oftentimes are not, are of magnitudes that far exceed anything that you've ever seen before. And that's, and I think that's really hard. You just, you just, you, you start to guess as to what works the best and cross your fingers. Christy, which, is not, it like, which is not a really specific answer, but I think that, you know, I think that's why it's so problematic. Yeah, I think accepting the fact that you can't that there's a certain level of preparation that's just not possible and pre preparing for that <laughs> is a thing. So or if you're an immigration lawyer and all of a sudden Donald Trump is your president and they find ways that were devilish to make life impossible for people, again, their presidents have been more pro-immigration than others. Nobody kind of took the scorched earth policy approach um, you know, of the last four years. And um, you know, I'm sure it's not an area of expertise of mine, but I'm sure that there were folks that were just going, what do we do? We've never come across, you know, Stephen Miller is the devil. Um, there, was no, there was nothing that, he, it, it was almost like he would try to find ways to torture people. And how do you handle a situation like that? It's a, it's a magnitude that's different than anything that came before it. Yeah, I've been practicing immigration law for 20 years, ever since uh, my clinic experience in law school. My first case was an asylum case from the Republic of Congo. Um, pretty horrific 
um, facts. And uh, 20 years couldn't have prepared me for what happened in the last four. And it was really um, amazing how many lessons we learned as immigration lawyers in the last four years and how we've come together uh, and, and have been, you know, again, not, not centering ourselves, but centering our clients and sort of how best to serve them and breaking down silos in order to do that work. Um, and it's something that I hope every crisis um, we emerge from with, with sort of new, new allies in, in some of the same old fights, because I can tell you um, now, that, now that New York is mobilizing to receive um, folks from the, the migrant um, protection protocols, I always remember them as migrant persecution pro protocols, um, they're arriving in New York state and New York immigration lawyers who helped respond to the Muslim ban, who helped respond to the crisis at the Albany County Jail are now, it's the same crew that's responding to the arrival of, of refugees uh, to the state of New York when President Biden started to unravel a lot of these harmful immigration policies. Um, so uh, Christy, can you crisis proof the DOJ? Yeah, um, I think, uh... I think it's actually a mistake to try to crisis proof your practice as a lawyer because um, then you might come under this impression that you won't have a crisis. And I think you should always be prepared for the fact that there may well be a crisis and, and, and learn from the past one and be ready for the next one. And that includes, in part, includes the sorts of things that you were talking about earlier, Sarah. Um, you know, be learning to be as transparent as possible and what that means. Um, you know, so learning the principles of, okay, the next crisis, what am I going to do? Okay, I'm going to realize there's going to be these other people who are freaking out more than I am, and I'm going to try to be like a calming force rather than a further, you know, um, you know, sort of escalating force to the crisis that they're feeling. I'm going to try to be as transparent as possible. I know there's going to be a lot of questions. Information is going to be coming to people rapidly. People are going to want to give a lot of answers that they don't really have answers to yet. I'm going to try to be, you know, as, you know, let people know, here's what we know, here's what we don't. Um, that sort of thing. And, you know, I think that the, one of the most important things you have to, and this sounds very cool, when you're a lawyer, there's so many things, especially in a crisis that you cannot control. And you can control your own integrity and your own self. And I, and I think it's really important to keep in mind because there can be a lot of pressures in the middle of a crisis to cut corners or to, um, you know, to, to do the thing that seems right in that crisis moment that seems justified by the crisis. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything big, um, but just, you know, just try to do the thing that, the, try to handle, try to keep in mind that the one thing you can control is your own actions in that space and do the best that you can do. Um, and, you know, influence whatever, try to influence what everybody else is doing to the best, to, you know, to the extent that you can, but know that like your first um, sort of responsibility is to make sure that you do the right thing. And I think that actually in a weird way kind of takes some of the pressure off. Um, you don't have to solve everything for everybody. You have to do this one thing um, and it can save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Excellent. So we are up against our next code word for those of you following along at home. It's opportunity two. Opportunity with the number two. So you can write that down. Um, this actually is, is blending nicely into our next question. It's almost like Ray planned it that way. Um, but just thinking a little bit more deeper on this question of crisis proofing, I really, it does sort of start with habits and best practices to be able to be calm in the moment, to be able to think clear enough to know what is the right thing. Um, so it may not speak to, to crisis proofing, um, but what recommendations do you have for students who are still in law school, who many of whom came to law school because they want to change the world? That's what we're hearing from students who have been motivated um, to come to law school recently, right? It's no longer, well, you know, I, I, I didn't get into med school or I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what to do next with my life. You know, there's some, sometimes there's always a healthy cohort of, of that group, but it seems like increasingly we're hearing from law students, I want to go to law school to change the world. And maybe since we do have a lot of um, folks on here who are you know, long removed from law school, um, it's never too late to get involved in, in this type of lawyering. So what are the, 
habits and best practices that allow you to be effective in crisis as you reflect on your um, time before the crisis, during, and after? And what advice do you have for other students or people who are considering a turn toward maybe some pro bono work in crisis learning or an entire career shift? And I'll throw that to either one of you, whoever wants to go first. Well, I'm not on mute, so I'll, I'll go first. I, I, I told Ray that um, we were emailing back and forth that the thing that kept me calm was uh, getting much better at the crossword puzzle. Um, but, you know, putting that aside, I think what really helped was that I had a sense of what level of immediacy I wanted. Um, and meaning the, the, the nexus between the problem and the solution. Um, and then, uh, and I only found that out kind of like by trial and error. Um, I always tell people, try something big, you know, try something policy wise and try something small, like representing individuals and see which one you like. And, you know, I think that that I found that very helpful. I, as I mentioned before, we had people who came into the office and whoever opened the door helped that person. So I did, you know, we call the, uh, you know, kind of guerrilla social work, um, uh, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. And, um, uh, you know, that was really helpful to deal with, you know, you, to know that I, I could help somebody at that moment, but I also could work on the long-term solution to the problem. So kind of knowing where you are in this and what you like about litigating or not litigating, I think is really helpful because if you don't want to be the, you know, the square peg in the round hole, it needs to be consistent with your personality and what you're looking to get out of it. Because every, like everybody gets paid, you know, nobody's saying that everybody's got to be Mother Teresa. Um, so everything is about degrees and compromises, and you should, you know, particularly with the salaries and public interest, that is something you get to give up. But uh, so in exchange, it should you should be doing what you like, what you find rewarding, um, you know, and consistent with your personality. So to me, the immediacy thing was, you know, was very important. Did I need to help individuals, or could I write policy papers? Um, I think the other thing that was helpful to me is not to have rescue fantasies. Um, you got to recognize that there are some parts of this where you're just not going to win, depending on how you find, define the word win, or it's not going to be tomorrow. Um, and to not do the things that are inconsistent with that. I am totally against the death penalty. I could never do death penalty work. I mean, I just, I just couldn't do it. It's not, you know, it's not something that um, would be consistent with you know, what I think I would be best at. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I'm very pro-immigration. Immigration law never interested me when I took it as a class. So again, it's like, what do you, you know, what do you find that's interesting? What's immediate? And the only way you can do this is by kind of dabbling. Um, this is what you can do, particularly in the beginning. If you're doing pro bono, take a bunch of different kinds of cases. Try a bunch of different things. Um, if you're an established lawyer, if you're in law school, try a bunch of different clinics and see what your niche is. And you know, that's how you, I think you kind of find out how you fit in. And then again, you just have to have a realistic understanding of what success is. Um, you may not get a smack down victory, you know, the next day in all these things. And you're certainly not gonna do it if you're doing building low income housing, which can take five years. Definitely. And Christy, do you wanna, that seems like a perfect place for you to build on in terms yeah. of, of seeing the longer term benefits of the work that yeah. you did. Yeah, so I, uh, two things, the first very similar. Um, I, I do think that, you know, I talk to, I'm at a law school now, right, teaching, and I talk to a lot of law students who talk about what they should do. And, and they're often quite focused on substantively, what area of law should they go into? And it's, I've found it's at least as important um, to find out what fits you temperamentally. Um, and, you know, that, and that, in, in that, you need to be pretty precise. You, you may think, oh, I want to be a trial attorney. Well, being a trial attorney at, you know, a large law firm is very different than being a trial attorney in, you know, as a public defender, for example. And you might really think you like one and then you realize, oh my goodness, the energy of the other is just incredible. I really need to do that, even though I get paid one tenth as much money or whatever it is, right? And you need to really, so you do need to try out different things and really think about what do I, you know, what sort of feeds me so that I can keep doing this for a long time and not hate it every day or, or get burnt out quickly. And, and of course, recognizing that that may change over time. 
I think the other thing, if you are going into this work, the sort of the save the world sort of approach to it, um, I, I do think, and I know this is an extremely sounds like the old person who's taking the um, the compromising view, but I, I do think you have to take the long view. Um, I do think it's, you will very quickly get very um, burned out if you expected everything to change and now it's still the same. And, and for me, again, Ferguson really helped bring this forward to me. I was, I was pretty down after Ferguson when, after the report came out and after there was all this attention, not only to our report, but to the issues that, that you know, um, that the movement for Black Lives was raising that were resonating all across the world, it seemed. And like now people finally understand the role that race is playing in policing, the problems that we have, you know, the, the enormous um, problem that we have to address. And it, it felt like so quickly, everyone forgot that Donald Trump got elected and we were just like, we had gone so backwards. Um, and it wasn't until seeing the reaction of this country after George Floyd was killed on May 25th of last year, that I realized that all that work that organizers and others had done after Ferguson and during Ferguson was not for naught. It had just sort of, they were planting seeds that just took a while. Um, and I really saw them and, um, and I could, you know, I would take too long to go into why exactly I think that and what I saw, but you could really see after George Floyd was killed, the response to that, things that, the work that had been done before that. And I, um, that was really, helpful for me to see because it reminded me that the work we're doing now, and I think a lot of people are feeling this, wait, there was all this lofty rhetoric last summer. Why isn't that translating the policy changes that we should be seeing? You know, first think about where we are compared to where we were five years ago. And you might realize, oh, actually it's accomplished a little more than we thought. But secondly, know that you're, you're doing work now that may not bear fruit for a few years yet. And I have found that helpful in um, content in helping me stay motivated to to do this work. And I, and I don't think I'm fooling myself. I think there's some there's there's some there there. No, I think that's absolutely right. And um, and it was sort of sort of a similar thing. We 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 definitely did. I remember the first meeting that we sat down with um, the the sheriff and his staff in inside the jail and in, in a conference room inside, and, and we brought everybody and all of the the whole team that we had assembled, representatives from all the different nonprofits and um, the firms who were rallying with us, and um, we had all manner of ideas from yoga and arts and crafts and <laughs> and different things. I think glitter was mentioned at one point, and one of the the corrections officers just looked at us like, do you know where you are? <laughs> and what was amazing too, though, was that a lot of us learned that some of the, the reforms, um, I, sh I should say that differently, that, that some of us were not aware of some of the hyper-local reforms that were happening um, in terms of our own backyard uh, and, and, and sort of taking a new look at, um, the carceral system and really trying to reduce recidivism, bring the numbers down. I, I had been working um, with this um, particular sheriff's department, as I said, for six years before the particular, this crisis hit. And I honestly thought his office was like there in the jail and didn't realize it was like this uh, tons of stuff that was under the sheriff's office umbrella, everything from homelessness to now like COVID response, they're handling vaccinations and um, really opened wide up the possibility for students. And in the middle of this, and this is why I love these student stories, um, although I have an impatient animal, hold on. Um, working during COVID. <laughs> um, so I had a student who had put together um, and during an internship with Prisoners Legal Services, her vision, she had a, she was pursuing a JD as and had, also um, received an MSW and so she, uh, master's in social work. So she was really focused on re-entry and, and had this idea for a, a program which is now called New Beginnings, um, but where basically um, it's the only jail outside of New York City where when folks are checked into the, the county jail, they receive a caseworker at booking as opposed to at release. So from the moment they step foot in the jail, there's already a team that's that's figuring out housing and employment and um, addiction recovery and any manner of things. She sent it to me and I, I just on a whim forwarded it along to the sheriff thinking, you know, maybe this might come in handy. Wouldn't you know it? He loved it. She's now employed there full time. 
And this is not a student that I would ever imagine would be drawing a paycheck from a police department. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Um, she's a, a student who is changing the world from the inside out, literally in a, a county jail in upstate New York. And so it's these opportunities and open-mindedness, I think, um, this idea that, that you don't have to there are times when collaboration is harmful to the cause, but there are other times when it's like a really pragmatic way forward to the solution. Um, the only thing I kind of want to add on top of this, and um, we don't talk enough about it, is mental health. Uh, and I know that law schools are getting better about talking about this. The bench and bar is getting better at talking about this. But we lost a lot of colleagues and friends um, who were immigration lawyers uh, over the last several years, sort of a disproportionate number um, because of the stress involved. And so I guess another tip is that I would add is to that I teach my students, it's a matter of professional responsibility. I model it for them. Um, I, uh, I ask them to, to bill it to their, <laughs> to their time sheets, but um, therapy, uh, before you, if you know that a crisis is coming and you want to check in and make sure that you're doing all of the things that Christy and, and Richard were saying in terms of like getting your priorities straight as a person, it will help you and translate into making sure that your priorities are straight in your professional life as well. Um, and so I teach it as a matter of professional responsibility, both before the crisis and after the crisis when you're processing what just happened and your role in it and all of the things that happen to other people that you care about in the process. It's a lot to navigate. And so, um, especially if you have insurance, uh, <laughs> I give two thumbs up to making sure that you um, are checking in with mental health providers um, to make sure that you can do the work for the long haul. So we're going to open up to questions and this is where I send it back to the students. I know that the, the students likely have questions. I, it looks like our chat has been very quiet, but I want people to not be shy. And if it's a question that you want to ask, but you don't want everyone to see, uh, you can uh, private message. You just take that little drop down box in the chat and switch it to my name um, or Jeff Sieber's name. Um, Jeff with a G, we're the co-hosts, and we can ask those questions without attribution, if, you, if you'd like. So with that, I'll hand it back to Ben. Yeah, thank you. Um, so not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Um, I actually came up with a couple just myself that I was hoping uh, might get the ball rolling a little bit. Um, so again, just to follow up on Sarah's point, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. and We'll get around to them soon. Um, but following up on the discussion of mental health, and I'm very glad you brought that up, uh, I know uh, Mr. Pinner mentioned that crossword puzzles were something that he used to sort of decompress uh, while dealing with these crises. I'm wondering if, if any of you three had other similar just decompressing tips that you used um, throughout dealing with these crises, and even to do with like scheduling your day, eating, sleeping, um, I think a lot of law students here are maybe worried about that point. I would say any advice that I would give would be terrible because I was probably the worst role model. Um, I worked and went to school at the same time and probably way overdid it. Um, I just work better that way. And uh, you know, I can, un I can unwind fairly easily. Um, so, you know, crossword puzzle wasn't totally facetious. Um, TV and, and naps um, also really help, but that's just, I, I think knowing what, knowing yourself and knowing what it takes for each person to be able to cope is, you know, is the most important thing. And whether that's something you can figure out on your own or through, or, or through a licensed professional, um, you know, that's the trick. And uh, so there's no, I don't think there's any one way. And my advice, like I said, my advice would be terrible. I'm not the role model on this. Um, except I did graduate and I did work. So um, I did manage to, you know, I did manage to thread that needle, but I would not, if it, no one on this, no one on, on this conference, Zoom conference should follow what I did. 
yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of crossword puzzles as well. I, <laughs> I, I was really mad when the New York Times made you purchase the app separately. They, they used to be free. And now, <laughs> now it costs like six bucks to do crosswords puzzles. And for whatever reason, that was like deeply painful to me. Um, and it shouldn't be. So maybe I should talk to my therapist about it. But, um, you know, I think, I, I think it's also about uh, avoiding unhealthy habits. We, we, let's be honest, we're in a profession where people really, um, it, it's endemic in the profession. It's part of law school culture at every law school I've ever, ever visited or attended or taught at, um, in some form or another, unhealthy coping mechanisms make their way into the culture. And so um, I think being honest with yourself about which of those you need, you, you, you might um, think of tackling is also sort of like a reverse form <laughs> um, because the more that you can, that you can uh, separate yourself from unhealthy coping strategies, the more the healthy coping strategies can then fill in those spots and, and places. And we also don't ask for help very much. It's, it's um, still culturally as lawyers, uh, we're supposed to be able to solve the problem and, and be assertive. And um, again, I think this is really difficult as Christy lifted up for um, women and, and law students of color and black law students um, sort of to, to reach out um, or find community. And so I have sort of a separate crisis community <laughs> that people that I know who have been in these situations before and like what it, it you know, replace crisis with anything else um, to, to find people who have, who have been, who are similarly situated and have similar struggles and not be afraid to create a safe space to talk to each other uh, about how to, how to navigate it because it's, it, it doesn't need to be diagnosable in order for you to reach out for help. And, and I, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be afraid of trying something with the idea that there could be a downside to it. I mean, I think it's worth, you know, if if this is something that interests you, you try it. Um, I actually found working and going to school at the same time easier than doing one or another. Um, I found that litigating, you know, uh, these kinds of cases really helped me understand the, the books better. Um, you know, there's one thing to talk about a preliminary preliminary injunction or pronounce it. There's another thing to actually file one. And so you know what it looks like. You understand, you know, the neatest thing to me was when um, we were reading, uh, I, I was reading the New York practice book. And one of the cases I worked on was in the book. Um, and that, you know, that was kind of neat. And, but it also made it a lot easier to understand. So again, I wouldn't just shy away from trying to maybe overextend yourself a bit, but the trick is to know yourself. There's, you know, there's a difference between overextending and, you know, and, um, you know, and uh, running yourself into the ground where you end up not knowing, uh, you know, what's up and what's down. So I think, again, you have to kind of know yourself and, um, and also have your friends keep an eye out on you and talk to people and not just sit in a room and isolate yourself. And um, so, so I, I, think I think it's doable, but it is tricky. Yeah, thanks. Those are all good points. Professor Lopez, did you have thoughts on that one? Just a, a couple, just to add one obvious one, I don't think I heard anyone say is that um, I, we always talk about exercise as a coping mechanism. And of course, that's really, really useful and important. I think one problem that lawyers sometimes have is that we tend to be such overachievers that we like, oh, well, if, you know, I can't just go for a walk. I have to go for a five mile run or I can't just, you know, go to the gym for 20 minutes. If, if I don't have time to go for an hour and a half, I shouldn't go at all. And we, you know, I think you need to kind of break yourself from that and just be like anything you can do if you're especially in the middle of a crisis you may not have time for that but just just remember anything you can do will, will help clear your head and the other thing i think is just um to, to sort of building on the point that other people are making you know to find that sort of hobby with people who are outside your crisis world that will um or your lawyer world your work um that may help you um remember that there is a way to live your life where you don't work 24 7. I think when you're in a crisis, you can get used to working 24 seven and you forget what, what does one do when one is not working for 20 years? Like, what do I do? I guess I'll, you know, write an article or I'll, you know, take out another case. Well, no, there is actually this thing called work-life balance and it's kind of important. And so I think one way to sort of force yourself to do that is to develop, to develop other hobby. For me, it was um, ultimate Frisbee of all things, which was especially odd because I never played any organized sports really growing up. And then during my clerkship, I discovered Ultimate Frisbee and that created for me a whole community. It's great because it's like no referees, it's sort of self-officiated, so it's, it goes against all the rules of lawyering. Um, 
And, you know, but whatever it is, it might be pottery, it might be, you know, whatever it is, um, just find the thing that gives you a cohort of people that helps you, um, you know, just do stuff when you're not at work. And remember that there's other people doing other things who think about other um, uh, ways of, of looking at the world than all the people you've been surrounding yourself with. I think that can be really helpful, really healthy. Yeah, I had, I had team members who actually kicked me out of Slack in week six of our crisis and they wouldn't, everybody kicked me out. Nobody would answer my text messages. They said, you have the next 24 hours off. You have to trust that we have this under control. And it was like very disorienting, <laughs> but lovely. And so um, making sure that you're looking out for friends like that, that's a, a really great way to show up for your friends is to tell them they're not allowed to work for 24 hours. Yeah, those, those are all great tips. Thank you so much. Um, sort of going back to a, a topic that we spoke about a little bit earlier in the, in the discussion tonight, um, or Professor Lopez, you, you spoke about um, sort of the, the moment after the crisis hits and how people tend to sort of freak out and there might not be so much organizational clarity on whose uh, role is what and who should be saying what. Um, I'm wondering if any of the you three panelists um, have anecdotes or stories to share about common mistakes that people tend to make right when the crisis hits. Um, you know, because I know I know there tends to be a, a period of panic right when an acute crisis hits, I guess you would call it. Um, so are, are there any sort of lessons that that young attorneys or law students can take from those sort of stories where things went worse than they should have? Let me, I mean, do you, let me see if I can unpack this a bit. I mean, I, I think, you know, once you kind of start the ball rolling, mistakes, mistakes happen. I mean, there's like, you know, there's no way around it, you, you know, or things don't necessarily go your way. I mean, you could lose, you know, you could lose and, you know, you're, you run into court and you don't win. And so what do you do next? I think the trick is to kind of constantly be on guard and reassess where you are. Um, you know, who are, who are your partners? Um, is this approach working? Is this not approach not working? You know, is this, you know, do we abandon litigation now and come back in six months and try something again? Do we, um, you, know, tr you know, now do we ramp up, um, uh, you know, kind of our, our outreach efforts and, and, and uh, you know, working with, um, you know, with fellow travelers? So I, I think it's, there's no right answer to the question. You really have to take it as it kind of unfolds. And the trick is, again, to just kind of, to me, just constantly reassess what's going on. Um, it harkens back to the earlier point of, you know, one of the things I learned is if you keep on plugging away, you will win more often times than not. I mean, I think it's very, a lot of times, you know, even something as simple as you get turned down for something, you keep on trying, you keep on trying, maybe you take a couple months off and you try again. A lot of times it's just the cumulative effort or trying a slightly different tact. Um, you know, the line I like to use is, you know, the civil rights movement didn't begin and end with Brown versus Board of Ed. I mean, there were a lot of things that led up to it and a lot of things that came after it. And, you know, a lot of times it's very simple to say, oh yeah, that's the case. That was the moment. That was a moment and it was on a long continuum. And a lot of effort went in before that and a lot of effort has gone in since and it's not done yet. So, you know, I, I think you just kind of have to remember that there are, there are not these one moment and this is it uh, type things in, and sometimes there are, I mean, there's certain things like that's it. Um, uh, you know, certain election cases, you know, they declare the election and that's, you know, there's no, as you know, as we now know, like there's a date and that's it. But that's not typical in, in a lot of these situations. Yeah, there can be a, a, a tendency also to sort of buy into your own hype um, and center the lawyer and not the experience, the lived experience of those that you're assisting. Um, naturally in these situations when it's a especially when it's a situational crisis that the the, the press becomes aware of um i think some people have a tendency to think you know any press is good press and that's not necessarily true you have to think strategically about the intervention of um of media and public attention on the on the case that you're handling sometimes it's forced on you there's no way to get out of from under the guise of the press at the Department of Justice um, responding to a, a crisis in Ferguson. But we had a period of time that lasted about a week 
um, when where we really worked with our partners to make sure that what we were doing was not um, sent out to the media so that we could have a lot of things in place before before there was a lot of attention so that we could answer the questions that we knew were coming and answer them intelligently and in a systemic way. So that's something I think that uh, there's a tendency to sort of rush to the press and get the attention. And, and in some cases that's perfect in terms of what the client needs in that moment, but that should be the thought. Like, will this help our client or not? Not, will this bring attention to the work that we're doing or not? Yeah, I think um, sort of related to that, one of the things I experienced um, again was being on, you know, on one of the lowest rungs of the ladder or the lowest point of the totem pole, whatever the right metaphor is, was that people, um, you know, I would just be sitting there and someone would tell me you know, like, oh, you know, oh, the attorney general said what? Um, and that was now the message. And I, there was no way I was, you know, we, I wasn't going back and, you know, second, I was going to count around the, the whatever it was the attorney general said, um, and so I think you do have to try to get your messaging right, and you do have to try to, to know um, how to how to affect the communications. But you also have to realize that sometimes, for whatever reason, like some message is going to get out that it's just not consistent with what you thought the plan was, or what you want the plan to be, or whatever it is. And you have to, or, or, or it's just wrong, it's inaccurate. And one of the things I think is really important to keep in mind is not to sort of then um, kind of fall victim of that hyper, but because uh, there will be this, there will be this, you know, it's a little bit, I don't, and I love the press and I love the media, so I don't mean this to sound derogatory, but there is a bit of, you, you sort of feel like this, this, the shark smelling blood, like, okay, we're gonna get this and you just like, hey, you know, you just have to, again, this is not a big deal. We're doing the same thing we've always been doing and just really try to get everybody to just chill and, and be thinking about what you're really after and just redirect to what you're doing. And I think just in any crisis, there's going to be so many things that are pushing you in all different directions and you just have to always have your sights on what are we here for? What are we doing? No matter what the issue is, trying to bring you back to that central, um, not just message, but like role, like this is what we're here for. And that can be helpful. Great, thank you so much. Um, I I have one more. Um, I don't know if anyone else. Uh... Well, that's perfect. I think that's all. That's all we have time for anyway. I think because we're wrapping. We're six twenty three. Yeah, and this 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 can be a really quick one. Um, just for the law students in the room, what are some experiences uh, during law school that you all think students should be seeking out that would help them either be good lawyers in general or good lawyers in crisis situations? I should let you guys go because on it, I'm, I'm the, the director of our clinical program. So I, I am duty bound to tell you all to take a clinic <laughs> because taking a case in a clinic automatically throws your, your law school plan into a different level of operation because clients don't follow the academic calendar. So <laughs> it, it forces you to rearrange your time management um, around you know, uh, a case as opposed to um, your life, which is a big, a big shift to make, um, but an essential one. And I, I encourage everyone uh, to take a clinic. I'm sure my co-panelists have more, more advice. Chris, do you want me to go again? Because again, you're on, you're on mute. Um, uh, I feel like I'm jumping in each time. I, 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 to me, the answer is school is great. You need kind of, um, the philosophical background of the classes, but you need to kind of get in among the people, get in among the situations that you're looking at and that you find, you know, that you think you find interesting. It may change your mind once you do it. I, I, I mean, I remember I was, you know, when I was in college, I was taking a constitutional law class. And um, I thought like, this is really interesting. Then I went on a ride along with the Baltimore, Baltimore Police Department and realized this is very different than what's in the books. Um, and I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, so you, you, you do, the, the, the classwork is a good underpinning and an understanding of how the things fit together on paper, but it's really helpful, at least to me, to see how these things play themselves out in real life and with real people 
um, you know, and not just you know, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, names that are in captions at the top of the at the top of the page. So that was that was my way of doing this. Um, when I was in college, I interned for a member of Parliament. I interned for a member of Congress, and I worked in the DA's office um, in Baltimore for two different semesters. So I did a lot of stuff out of the classroom, and that is why I quickly um, decided. Uh, being a corporate lawyer was not going to be was just not going to be consistent with my personality. So I, I would just try as much stuff as you can, you know, within your tolerance for for you know for time. And I, uh, also, you, you decide what you don't like. Also, you can say I don't like this, and that's a positive thing to learn. Sorry, sorry for jumping in again. No, you're good. No, I always found that one of the most valuable teams were people who had had like jobs. Um, like not lawyer jobs, but like being a waitress or, you know, working, you know, whatever, um, or maybe had organized a bunch of conferences. Um, and, and the reason why is that you need people who don't think that, oh, my job's a lawyer, I'm going to think and write and ask important questions. You're like, your job is to move all these chairs from here into a circle because we're about to meet with 25 community members. Or, you know, your job is to type this right now and, or, you know, whatever. Your job is to, you know, empty these trash cans because we can't hold this meeting in this jail cell. What that is, you know, I mean, whatever it is, you need people who just think about the fact that there are, you know, you know, really small jobs that need to get done. And guess what? You're them. Um, because it's really a problem if you have to be telling people, you know, it's, it's just such a, it's such a gift when you have people who are thinking of, about doing those things on their own, um, rather than you having to tell them all. And that's a lot of what the kind of social justice lawyering and crisis lawyering is about. You just have to do whatever it takes in the moment to get you from point A to point B. And it's a real pain to have to teach people who've never had that experience of um, needing to act on so many different levels. Um, it can take a while for them to get used to that. And it's really nice when you have someone who you could just know, like they've, they know that no one else is here to do this for them. They're gonna have to just pitch in, um, whatever that means. Yeah, I think in that vein, um, getting involved in, in local politics, because that gives you the fluidity to be able to dip your toe in and out. It works really well with a student schedule. Um, uh, we're getting a question whether or not there's another code. I don't believe that there is. There were just the two. So you're off the hook. Um, but uh, but yeah, working on, on, on any sort of, of, of political campaign because Campaigns are not afraid to tell you exactly what they need, and 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 often that means licking envelopes or organizing chairs, as opposed to writing really fancy policy briefs. The biggest gift, one of the biggest gifts to me uh, of my entire law school experience, was when my constitutional law professor Mark Alexander introduced me to then Councilman Cory Booker um, at a Black Law Students Association dinner dance. Um, he gave a speech. I thought he was God's gift to politics <laughs> and followed him around for an entire summer and got into some really interesting work through through his political office and then and then you know formalized that through through my career working at a small firm when he lost his first campaign and then joined the firm. So um, you just never know where where I literally started you know stuffing envelopes and filling, helping people fill out voter registration forms in his his little office in the central ward of Newark, New Jersey. Um, and then working on a losing campaign right after. So you just don't know where those opportunities are going to lead you. Um, the intern that that I worked that I shared a desk with sometimes is now was his former chief of staff and is now the the assistant to the new attorney general. So um, you know, just dabble and see what happens um, because life really unfolds itself in mysterious ways in the in the law. I think that's a, a pretty decent note to end on. Um, thank you, Ben. Thank you to all the students. Thanks again to, to Jeff and Lisa at Albany Law for supporting this. And thanks to all of you for coming. It was great to share this evening with you. Have a great night. Thanks so much.